Hello and welcome to another episode of Wannabe Entrepreneur. We are back to a great interview and uh, today my guest's name is uh, Alessandra. Let me see if I can say this. <laughs> Chichitano, no. Chiquitano. <laughs> How do It's you fine. Chiquitano. <laughs> Chiquitano. Alessandra yes. Chiquitano. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I, 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 I like the name. It's, I like the name. It's, uh, it's, it's very Italian, isn't it? Like it Chiquitano. is very, very Italian. It yeah. is. Welcome, uh, Alessandra. Thank you so much for uh, sharing a bit of your time with us, the wannabe Thank entrepreneurs. You. Thank you. Yeah. So the way I found Ale, uh, Alessandra was in uh, Twitter. You know, <laughs> the the community or the platform for bootstrappers. I've been uh, using Twitter as uh, probably my listeners know quite a lot. And um, I just uh, shoot you a message and uh, here, here you are to, to speak about, or at least we, we will focus on uh, breaking down products. Uh, Alessandra has a background in the project management, but she has so many things we are now just chatting about and she has so many interesting projects going on. So I think it's going to, we will learn a lot from Alessandra and a lot of things that uh, as bootstrappers can can use. And um, to kick things off, I would ask you, Alessandra, to just uh, introduce yourself, give a couple of words about uh, you and your background, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Hello, everyone. So as uh, Tiago already said, I, my background is, uh, is in product management, but it actually starts from tech. So uh, my whole career was, uh, was in tech, mainly information technology. So in IT, I started as a researcher, then software developer, and then I started going up uh, in, uh, in the companies I was working for uh, as a project manager and product manager. And then uh, a few years ago, I decided to go my own way. So I started my own business. Uh, and at the same time, I started lecturing in a university here. And I started doing product strategy for the tech vertical. So this is uh, uh, the, the, the main uh, objective of my consulting business. So this is how I started. But then at some point, um, I I launched my own, that happened really like uh, by by mistake almost mm -hmm. that I started launching my own product, uh, which is a little newsletter that I have that I uh, never uh, thought it was going to grow so much. And this is when from a product strategist, so you know coming in and helping you building the strategy to launch the, your tech product in the, on the market in the best way, I became a sort of like a product uh, yeah. parent myself, <laughs> which is which is a little bit different than what I what I do, you know, in my in my daily business. Yeah. yeah. So, so you said that you started as a as a researcher. Then a, you you did yeah. also software development. I did, yes. And then you switched to project management. So why why did you switch from software to uh, or to from developing software to being a project manager? It just happened. I have to be honest with you. So basically, uh, I I have a degree in computer engineering, and then mm. I continue with a PhD in uh, uh, systems and computer engineering, and this is how I landed in IBM doing research. And wow. then I got tired of research. I needed to do something more concrete. And research is a is a lot of fun, but it's also a very competitive space. So I decided to to go into software development because I wanted to see, you know, my work becoming something tangible. Yes. Yes. Um, but you know, four or five years into software development. Uh, I sort of stumbled uh, on a project that I, I really liked uh, for whatever reason. Uh, it's not that nobody wanted to manage, but the product, the project manager there wasn't wasn't really good. And I saw opportunities into the project. So I sort of stepped up mm -hmm. uh, because I really wanted to grow that project. And, and this is how I started. So then the project uh, grew into a community. So I started building a, a, a community around the whole project. It started going really well. And then the word spread, you know, mm -hmm. about the work I was doing. So I started getting, uh, you know, job offers in, uh, in, 
uh, other projects. And then I got a job offer in a company that was building products um, following a community approach. This was a very interesting job that I had. So basically everything they were building, every product they were building was coming out of the community they had. Mm. Interesting. That was it was very interesting and I loved it, Tiago. It was amazing. Like for every product that we had, there was a whole community around. Right. And for every product, we had a board uh, that was supporting the work coming from the community. So it was, uh, uh, and the community was, was brilliant. So, mm. and that's what, how... What was the community about? So uh, I was in cybersecurity then okay. and i was especially working in identity management so the community uh so the products that belonged to to uh pure cyber security like certificates i was i was in the certificate uh space uh there were mainly sizes uh, so or CISOs, mm -hmm. I, and mm -hmm. there is always this like it's uh so it, security engineers basically and uh, and security officers mm -hmm. And right. then in the identity management space, it was like all the people in identity. Right. So it's, it's it, there was a, a community or uh, this company built what what is called, I guess, the audience first approach. So they had a community. Community first, yes. Or community in this case, yeah, community first approach. Yes. They had a community uh, the, of uh, people that uh, really were passionate about cybersecurity. Yes. And they would take ideas from the community. Yes. And um, how, how would these ideas be collected? Because we had a very, very close relationship with the community itself. So the company, to begin with, the company is backed by the European Commission. Okay. So uh, it's, uh, it's, the commission brings in all the different countries in Europe Right. So I, I don't know if you know how you, European uh, EC funded projects uh, work, but no. usually in one in one project they bring in uh, they try to bring in as many uh, uh, countries European countries as possible. So right. at some point they decided to back this specific company to build the whole community, and then the the company was so like ingrained, you know, that we had a, an annual conference. With the whole community, and the conference was huge. Wow. Which platform did they use to build this community? Was it Twitter? Was it a public platform? How was it? We didn't have any platform. Can you believe it? It was, it was, uh, it was uh, con constantly being in, in, in contact with people. But so we didn't it, use with Twitter. email or. Yeah, with emails, with wikis, with uh, wow, internal okay. tools. Lately, we were using the, the last years that we were using uh, uh, Slack, but uh, it was really a face to face. Right. So uh, we that's the reason why we traveled like crazy. Mm -hmm. I was constantly traveling uh, because we were like uh, meeting. Uh, uh, we were having like project meetings or, for example, we would have task forces. These were the ones I loved the most because out of task forces, we got the ideas on which product to start working on and, and start build, building. And we would meet once a month, you know, mm -hmm. to like for two or three days right. uh, in person to mm -hmm. discuss, you know, this, uh, the projects on all the products we were working on. Right. So I, I guess we, we can... Uh take this as a as a way to start the process of building a product because i'm also very interested in in knowing what are your thoughts on it and um yeah so let's say you identify um a problem right so i guess you're yeah. speaking with the community the community yeah. will tell you about the problem what, yeah. what would be the next the next steps I think it. I think it really depends. You know, it, mm -hmm. it's uh, in a community that you have some more advanced people that are aware. You know, they are able to see the problem, mm -hmm. and then they come to you and tell you where the problem is, or you have simply people that complain. Right. Right. So they they're not aware, like, or or they they express you know their feelings, but they're not aware of the problem itself. They're not able to come to you and tell you we have this problem. You know, they they just so you, you need to be open. You know, you need to listen very much. Mm -hmm. 
So either somebody comes to you and tells you, okay, we have we have a problem, we wanna we want a solution to that, and that's the the best. Uh, situation yes. and then uh, you have to validate you still have to validate the idea of course because one person doesn't mean that the whole uh, community might have the yeah, same problem yeah. so you still I- need ideally to... multiple people will complain yeah. or will tell you about that problem right? exactly exactly mm-hmm. so you still need to go out you know and understand whether there are others have complaining about the same things or experiencing yeah. the same yeah. problem uh, and uh, uh, that's a little bit, you know, what happened with uh, uh, this productized service that I was managing at the mm-hmm. end, which was this certificate uh, uh, thing. So the whole community had a problem. They wanted to have one provider, one certificate yeah. provider. And uh, so they came to us uh, saying that maybe this is something we could do for them. Okay. So we became the interface between them and the uh, and the uh, right. certificate mm-hmm. provider. Can you can you uh, because some of the listeners here are non tech yeah. people? Can yeah. you like explain to you know non tech people what what is this? Why is it so important to have a certificate provider? And... Oh, okay. Well, I'll do the the most simple version. Mm-hmm. Okay, so basically, uh, if you if you uh, are on a website, uh, right, and mm-hmm. uh, uh, you see that there is a lock on your website, yeah. it means that you're using a certificate. Yeah, which next make, to the link, right? Next exactly. To the link make next to the URL. URL. Mm -hmm. which makes your connection protected, Mm -hmm. right? So, and it it validates that the website is a valid website. No, it's a a recognized Mm -hmm. website. Uh, If you wouldn't have that, uh, it means that the website, you know, the the provider behind the website is not recognized. So it might be like a scammer or or something like that. So you might think that you're using Facebook, but actually you are using some hacker's website. Exactly, Mm -hmm. exactly. But that's really the most, the simplest, you know, because then you use certificates also when you connect to specific servers, uh, you know, or I don't know, to your bank or or stuff like that. So Mm -hmm. it's, uh, but this is the one that we can all look at, you know, like it's the, the easiest to see you just right. go on a website and if there is a lock you know that the website has a, a an ssl certificate mm-hmm. so it is safe and uh and recognized correct and then these entities uh, that yeah. the ones that uh, this community wanted you to create are the ones that give the certificates right no they 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 wanted uh so certificates cannot be issued like that there is a whole process to be recognized okay. as a of course like we're talking of safety right and it's of a course. very uh sensitive topic but they had services themselves right you have to see it as a b2b right. business so they were offering their services to their own customers and they needed to buy the certificates from someone else Right. Right. And mm-hmm. and they didn't want to have to deal with the whole uh, uh, um, uh, process of buying certificates in bulk because that's how they needed it. So they thought we could do the whole thing for them. So they would just receive the certificate. They're already validated and all the process behind, like they, they didn't want to see that. Right. Right. So they you're... just. Were... An interface between exactly. this company and the certificate. Yes, uh, we would sure. vet. We would vet the provider. You know, mm-hmm. we would uh, make the contract with the provider. Uh, we would uh, uh, look at the at the different certificates. So all the process that you would need, that they needed to do by themselves, they right. just paid right. us to do it, and the whole problem went away mm-hmm. for them. And then, so this is a B two B business, yeah. uh, as you as you said. Yeah. And uh, or B two B product, and then yeah. you you, I guess you would make money even if you only had one client, right? Or did you end up also yeah. having multiple clients? Oh yeah, we had many. Okay, we had many. Um, so it's uh, it would take the whole uh, episode to explain <laughs> the the whole business model, but we had many, and uh, uh, the the way they paid the certificate. Well, it's it's. There was a whole uh, model that we were using to determine how much they would pay us every year to handle their own uh, certificates. Okay. But Are we the... would have made money also with one with client. One. Yeah. For the way it was built, like we would mm-hmm. have made money anyway. And uh, 
I think this is a very interesting topic because as myself, uh, I also consider myself a bootstrapper. Yeah. But for some reason, I have all my ideas are B two C, yeah, or at least B two B two C. Yeah, and uh, with that I mean that, for instance, I have a climate change app, so yeah. I I sell to each user, and I need a lot of users to to yes. make money. The podcast yes. is the same. I'm selling the podcast to every listener. I I need to a lot of listeners to to make money. Yes, and um, and I'm always thinking about okay, I want to do B two B. I have to come up mm-hmm. with ideas. What what are your yeah. suggestions for someone that is, that is trying to come up with B two B businesses? Oh well, that's a good that's a good question. I think there are different ways, mm-hmm. but I can share the one I'm uh, I'm more used to, which is really try to find a problem within a specific area. So you need to to that's the way I would do it, right? right. So you need to look at the expertise you have, mm-hmm. and then you need to look at an area of businesses so right. if it's uh, i don't know if it's a fintech mm-hmm. just to make an easy simple no you need to look at banks what right. what services can you offer to a bank so what are the problems uh, the common problems that bank might have banks multiple might have right now that you can cover with an idea that you can develop for them right mm-hmm so you need to find a hole that you can cover, yeah. basically. And I guess the problem here is how do you get into how do you how do you find how do you communicate with banks, right? Like, and yeah. I think that's what where this uh, audience first or community first yeah. approach m- comes in, and it's really it makes it really easy for you to really understand what the what they need, right? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it, it, normally it's much easier if you are an insider, right? Exactly. You used mm-hmm. to work for a bank and then yeah. you noticed and then you just uh, get out and do your own uh, startup. Uh, so as an insider, it's uh, is much easier to identify the problem. Mm-hmm. As an outsider, it's still possible, but then you need to have some form of connection to the right. field. right. Yeah. yeah, you need to make that uh, make that yeah. connection. That's uh, very interesting. And um, then once you build the product, mm-hmm. you, I guess it's a bit different from B two B and B two C. So it is. Uh, yeah, I guess a B two B two B business. You need to already have your MVP needs to be a little bit more advanced because you are already going to pitch for possible paying customers, it, right? It depends. It depends. You can also go with a prototype. Okay. So I don't know, like, uh, let me, maybe, me. you know the difference between a prototype and an MVP, right? A prototype is uh, is not a product. Uh, it's just uh, a, an example of your product uh, with not even functionality. So mm-hmm. uh, something that shows how your product is going to work. Right. You can also you can also test with that. Right. And honestly, this is what I suggest. So if we go back to uh, the consulting that I do, mm-hmm. usually what I suggest you ever you if you have an idea, you need to validate the idea, and uh, before you throw yourself into building an MVP, I usually suggest to put together a small prototype and go test the waters, you know, with right. the prototype. So for a prototype, you cannot ask for money, right? It's just to see if they would be willing I to pay. I think you can. You can I know, already? I, I yeah. know a startup that actually closed a bunch of deals on a prototype. And then with the money, these are actually, br- they, they were very much br- bootstrapped. Wow. So what mm-hmm. they did, they saw a, an opportunity right at the beginning of the pandemic okay and uh, uh they decided to quickly put together a prototype uh, their their service uh, they wanted to sell to universities okay so they built a prototype and then they went to pitch to a bunch of universities mm-hmm. and the universities agreed so they actually closed the deal on the prototype with the money they got from the universities they build the actual product. Oh, okay. And it worked. 
Wow. It worked very well. That's but kind of the Kickstarter approach somehow. Yeah, isn't it? because they were also like, you know, they were also very smart in identifying, you know, that mm. for the universities, uh, that most, you know, universities had that specific pain point in common. Because that's also the other thing. When you build a, a B2B um, model, mm -hmm. Of course, like you want to have, you want to be sure to have one client that at least pays, you know, that vali right. validates the whole idea. But then you need to be sure that you have multiple clients. You cannot survive only on one client. So if you build the product for one client, uh, you basically uh, put yourself in a very yeah. hard situation because the exactly. client owns you. Mm -hmm. So you need to build to be sure that your solution is going to be bought by different businesses. Yeah. So in the same area, right? But by different companies, right. so that uh, you can, you know, if one day like uh, one decides not to uh, pay you anymore or to go somewhere else, you still have all your all other clients. Yes, makes sense. And these founders, they were very good to understand that multiple universities uh, uh, at the beginning of had the, the, same the had mm -hmm. the same problem. What, the, the, what is the name of this company? I don't remember exactly. I have to be honest with you. Okay. It was, it was. Uh, um, I was in contact with this company like at the very beginning of my mm -hmm. of my business. But they were doing virtual fairs for universities. Virtual fairs, okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. That was a very quick thinking there because uh, yeah. it became super important super quick yeah you know? yeah i think they were already thinking about it to be honest mm. with you um, they were already yeah and then the the pandemic sort of you know like propelled their mm -hmm. business yeah it's interesting there's a lot of uh, examples like this i also interviewed yeah. here uh, miguel is uh, the ceo of a portuguese company that yeah. is trying to digitalize the hairdresser and uh, beauty uh, uh, services and yeah. they also use the pandemic as a way to to boost it so it's uh, it's interesting that's you know if in even in crisis there are people that are able to you know use it as an advantage uh, yeah yeah absolutely so i think i think the uh, pandemic was an opportunity for many businesses for some others it was a disaster but yes yeah in the in the it branch mm -hmm. i think it was really like a big opportunity yeah. I I also wanted to talk about your um, your uh, newsletter. Yeah. So when we were off off, off record, you you yeah. told me about how the newsletter came to be and how the the idea started. Can you share that here too with the listeners? Yes, yes, I love to do that because I still find it a very funny. Um process mm. uh, so to begin with you know just so for you all to know is that i had no intention to get into the newsletter business honestly <laughs> i had i thought i had no time to do that but uh, what happened is that at some point i came up with a framework for product strategy which i called uh, tech in the loop in the loop or mm. tilt which Tilt. is now the name of the newsletter, which took an idea from artificial intelligence, which is human in the loop. And I just twisted it around, you know, and I, mm -hmm. I turned it around and made it become tech in the loop. And I built this framework. And then um, it was it was to support myself in the work I was doing uh, right. with uh, with my clients. But I decided, you know, let me submit the abstract of this idea to a conference just to see if it's all in my head or there is something really there. So what happened is that the abstract got up accepted. I gave a talk about it and I got so much interest uh, that people were pinging me from everywhere. And I even got invited to give a keynote speech at a conference. Wow. So I thought I need to collect the pe people's address Emails. because in yeah, a yeah, bit yeah. I will forget and they will forget me. Yeah. So I started doing Tilt as a bi-weekly newsletter of curated content mm -hmm. about product strategy and human centricity because that's uh, that's what Tilt is about, you know, mm -hmm. to bring in product strategy, human centricity. And um, every two weeks I would send, you know, like uh, my little newsletter. And then uh, one day... Uh, um, I also mentor in a bunch of accelerators to help startups uh, to bring their product, you know, to, okay. to market. Mm -hmm. And then one day I was talking to an early stage, very early stage founder. We were having this conversation actually on uh, on Twitter. And I was I was like 
offering suggestions like maybe you could do this you know or maybe you could choose this distribu- distribution for your product and every time he was saying oh no no this is too expensive uh, you know you need money to do that yeah. uh, it's not like these successful products they have tons of money in to bring uh, you know to make their product uh, successful on the market and then i i thought yeah but you know like these super successful products at some point they were product that nobody knew. They were early stage products. So mm-hmm. they had to take decisions to grow. And this is right. when I realized that there, there weren't breakdown of successful uh, first years of successful products. And this is how I started doing uh, that myself. So I use the web archive and I do research of old uh, media press or old yeah. tweets sent by the founders and I started breaking down successful products and I called it the archaeology of zero to one which is mm. now a column in uh, in tilt and uh, uh, it's been very successful and uh, I honestly did not expect that I enjoy it like crazy I have yeah, to something share something you're passionate about right super passionate like I have to tell you I spend hours uh-huh a night to do this breakdown and and it's interesting because you connect your background as a researcher exactly and that's your edge right like that's your edge you you're you really go into the you know to the little details to the old tweets to everything and then you you do this and how how many then uh, readers do you have already uh, i have almost 300 readers and i started few you know like um, maybe a couple of months ago wow wow yeah that's really good yeah and uh, you know i have to tell you that the other thing is that i bring in the product approach mm-hmm. i'm not a marketer right so i'm not i don't break down the website i i really genuinely look at the distribution channels mm-hmm. and the growth on when they started right. so what the founders did to get to, you know, become successful. Yes. So it's, it's really the first years. So once they take off, I stop. I don't mm. uh, I don't continue the research because but clearly, the, yeah. Do, do you focus on a bootstrapping uh, company? So companies that did not get or almost to zero VC money or uh, you, you don't? I, uh, I don't. Anything? To be honest with you, whenever I start... Uh, uh, breaking down, I have no idea what I'm going to find. Mm, <laughs> so I, I focus on products that maybe I know right. or that I use or maybe that they were on the news and then I get curious to know how they they did it. And then uh, uh, like MailChimp was fully bootstrapped. Yeah. Right. So I ended up doing MailChimp and uh, I, I also did Canva. A Canva is very interesting because Canva didn't, wasn't actually born as Canva. Mm. So they started working on a project that is called Fusion Books. Okay. That one was bootstrapped. And uh, it was a very smart idea that Melanie Perkins had. So she understood that uh, universities, because she was doing some lecturing in graphic design while she was a student, and she understood that the uh, graphic design programs like photo, uh, Photoshop were too difficult to use and that every year uh, universities yeah, would yeah. end up paying uh, a lot of money in Australia to do these yearbooks. So they just built this little uh, web tool uh, where you know people, the people from university could do their own yearbook just within 30 minutes, you know, and it was super cheap for them and the outcome was uh, great. And then uh, Fusion Books would just print it and ship it to them. Mm -hmm. And it was really good because, you know, the the use case was really totally nailed down. They would do only that, yearbooks, and they knew exactly who to sell it to. So they would just basically go knock on doors and talk to the people at the university. And they did very well for seven years uh, and this is when they decided to start Canva mm-hmm. after seven years that they were working with Fusion Books and Fusion Books was doing great. They decided to expand and they started, you know, what today is Canva. So mm-hmm. a tool that is accessible for graphic design to mm-hmm. everyone. It's very, very interesting. And uh, I, I can see here also that in the um, your newsletter, you spoke, you spoke about Buffer. 
MailChimp, yeah. Canva, BuzzSumo. Yeah. And um, I think each one of them would uh, would lead a great conversation and we could do an episode about each one of them. But, yeah. Um, so I, I wanted to ask you, since we, of course, we don't yeah. have time for all of that. I wanted to ask you, is there actually one or two techniques that are common to all of these companies that you say, okay, you, if you do this, you probably will get some positive results. So uh, what I noticed is that they all had a very well-defined uh, use case. So um, uh, okay. Basumo, Canva, MailChimp, uh, they were all targeting uh, one specific use case. And uh, most of them were sort of insiders. So, so they, they were part of that community already. Yeah, exactly. So mm -hmm. MailChimp, they were uh, they started as a web agency. Okay. Uh, now I don't remember their name anymore. Uh, but they were already trying to help their their. Uh, clients you know to to sort of succeed online so mm -hmm. they started noticing that there was a problem with the with the way they were doing marketing with the emails so right uh, canva uh, same thing but sumo was a it was a little bit different the founders were software engineers but they mm -hmm. were really smart because they understood uh, that there was something there was there was a, a hole that they could cover right so they built Batsumo and they targeted a specific group of people, which was marketers. So they were all, uh, pre they pretty much knew mm -hmm. who they were going to work for. Yeah. Now this is, this is a great, uh, great tip. And it's something that I've been learning through my process as a, as a bootstrapper too, which is audience first approach. Yeah, it's it's really great because you will understand your your community, you'll understand your audience, and you'll find what are the problems that you can solve. And once you are, you find this problem, it's also very easy to distribute it, right? So that's yeah. also what happened with Mailchimp, right? They they were, yeah, they were already had kind of a newsletter. They already had the clients. Then they just yeah. built some product. And same with with Canva. And that's uh, yeah. that's super super interesting. Um, I think actually the next one coming up is the Slack. Wow. Slack, Slack was also bootstrapped? No, Slack was... Well, I mean, it's... Look, uh, Slack is really one of these cases. It happened with all of them, like that I start working and then something comes mm -hmm. up and I'm like, oh, I did not expect that. But with Slack, I, I didn't know much about them, but the stories, uh, the way it started is super, super, super interesting. Yeah. So... Uh, it's a, it's a story of pivoting. So I can't tell you whether it was because the original idea probably was funded, mm -hmm. but then they, they had to change everything. So that, that one is really interesting. Actually, if you get to read it, I would love to know your feedback. Yes, we'll definitely. So that's the next one coming yeah. up. It's, it's super interesting. I'm, I, I think we could talk about this for hours. Unfortunately, our time is, is, is up. But uh, let, let's promise here to the to the listeners that we'll find another slot just to to speak a bit more about this uh, these companies and about your findings because I feel that there's still a lot to explore. What do you think, Alessandra? Yeah, I would love that. I would love that. Let's arrange uh, soon again. And part two of our conversation. <laughs> Perfect. Sounds good. Yes. And um, Alessandra, I also wanted to invite you to join i know that you're a super busy and you have a lot of things so it's also okay if you don't have time but we also have our own uh, wannabe entrepreneur community it's also it's a slack community or i want to call it like a co-working space or virtual co-working space we are also planning to have some events we have a lot of entrepreneurs there and i would love to to extend my my invitation to you to also uh, join us there i absolutely I'm absolutely grateful for your invitation and I accept it oh, uh, <laughs> happily because uh, even though I'm busy, I always have time for interesting communities, uh, you know, an interesting exchange of ideas. I, I, I love that. So yeah. I'm super happy to join. Thank your you community. so much. Yeah, thank you so much. And I can see that you're really passionate about it, and that's, that's, that's what we want. We want passionate people, pa people that are passionate about building products and changing the world, you know, and, 
in the end, yes. it's, it's really important. Thank you so much thank you. for your thank time, you. Alessandra. And um, now, now for our listeners, I, Alessandra already promised that there will be a part two. So uh, be in the lookout for it. And if you are a new listener, there's also a lot of interviews that I've done about the journeys of entrepreneurs building their ideas, coming up with uh, with solutions for problems that all the bootstrap bootstrappers struggle with so make sure to check that and everything we we chat about including tilt and uh, the the newsletter of alexandra will be linked in the description so you can just go there and check it out so this was another wannabe entrepreneur thank you very much